I think I went hunting one time in my life, and uh, that was enough. I'm just not, I'm not a hunter, it's not in my blood. I carried a shotgun around the woods early in the morning, and by, you know, about seven or eight o'clock when the sun was coming up, I was ready to go home. The most embarrassing thing, and it happened to me often on stage, was forgetting lyrics. Uh, and sometimes it'll happen in the songs that you've sung every night, all of your career, and then you just get to a line and you go blank. And so very often it'll be songs that I have written, that Harold and I had written together. So I had been there and given birth to those songs, <laughs> but then you forget the lyrics and say, what is going on? What? And I would always sometimes stumble over them, but more times than not, then Harold would stop the music and say, he just forgot the words and he wrote that song. And he would even make the embarrassment bigger than it ordinarily would be. And that would be funny to everybody. And of course that solved the problem. Top three. I gotta say, you know, we're going, I'm thinking comedy now. I was a big fan of the Dick Van Dyke show. Still am, still see him in reruns and they hold up to me. I just loved him. I loved that cast. Um, gee, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm still a Perry Mason fan. I, I read, I have all of the Perry Mason novels. I read all of them and I never get tired of watching those television shows I used to watch on Saturday night when I was a kid. And number three, where am I gonna put number three? Gee, maybe the Ed Sullivan show, cause that was always fun to see. He had the hottest, acts that was on at the time and we would always make it a point to watch that on Sunday night to see who it was going to be from every field so that was fun that was you know in musical variety shows kind of a thing that I went for <laughs> you know I, I've never been a big laugher I'm not I'm not a good audience I'm not a good audience when I, you know, I don't laugh loud. I don't, usually something personal that happens in a room when you're around family or friends and something just spontaneously happens or is said, I laugh at that. I'm not a big laugher at routines and that's really kind of sorry to say because we did a lot of comedy and people were always so very kind to our comedy. But I, I was always, I kind of absorb comedy and I think about, oh yeah, that's funny. Instead of reacting and laughing. So, you know, I'm, I'm strange that way. My best friend growing up would have been Bobby, my next door neighbor. And uh, we went through childhood together and teenagers together and uh, lost him when he was 16 years old. He, uh, he died. And that was a sadness to me that it took a lifetime to get over. But yeah, we were best friends. Again, I have to go back to the childhood uh, Southern gospel days, back to the uh, states within the Blackwoods. We used to go see them. I, was, I remember as far back as like nine years old and going to see these guys. And they would always be at the table after the show selling their pictures and their albums. And they'd talk to you and shake your hand and very personable. And you know, James Blackwood and Hobie Lister and J.D. Sumner. And those were the first, the first ones. I collect everything. As a matter of fact, I got a lot of junk and it's everywhere. Uh, if you want to listen to my family, they always tell me, you ought to get rid of this stuff. Yeah, and I really should. I collect books. I just can't throw books away. So I do. I got rooms and shelves full of books, every kind of magical fiction, nonfiction, research books, everything. Uh, I've always enjoyed doing that. I used to collect magazines. I don't do that so much anymore. Magazines are a thing of another era. I. Uh, but I guess if I had to be a collector, it would be uh, it would be the books. Right now, my favorite meal is probably whatever I'm going to have this evening. But uh, you know, I'm a Cobb salad kind of guy. I'm a hamburger guy. 
I, uh, in, in chocolate pie, with no matter what I had to eat, that's what it has to end with. All of a sudden, I'm about 19 years old, and I'm on stage with him, with this legend, and we're there every night, and we're watching him perform, we're learning what to do on stage by watching him, how to work an audience, how to handle your career, uh, how to judge a song, how to write a song. Learned all this, never by John sitting down and said, look here, I want to show you something. No, it was just watching by example, learning, and he was very open with anything you want to talk about like that. But that is what, that's where I'm at when I see, I don't see the man in black necessarily. Uh, I see the man that uh, would come around the hotel room in the middle of the night, knock on the door and get a guitar and want to sing you a new song. Whether it's two or three o'clock in the morning, whatever impulse hit him at the time, he was that kind and so unique and so unusual. I, I smile at every one of those memories. Always on the bottom, always on the bottom. Phil was on the bunk right above me and it was always a time of joy to watch him get in it because he could leap into the top bunk, just put his hand there and he was in there. And it was so funny, he never got old and he never got old. I mean, he just always could do it. You could jump in it. I'm glad I never had to do that. I'd be awake before I ever got in bed. Prefer inside. I like the uh, theater kind of setting, the Coliseum setting, because it's there, the theater's dark, and you got 100% attention. When you're playing a festival or you're outside on the stage, there's so much to distract. There's birds flying across the sky. There's somebody over here doing something. There's a Ferris wheel behind you if you're at a state fair. There's just all kinds of things to distract, and you feel like you've got about 70% of the attention of the audience. But in a theater, there's nothing else to compete. And you go in there and that's when you can do your best work. I don't think so. I don't think it was ever late. Now we had a situation one time to where we were divided up into different vehicles and only Lou and I made it. Her own Phil and the band, the Tennessee Three, didn't make the show. That was back in the Johnny Cash days. Only John and June and Lou and I, and we had to play behind him and then go out and sing, be the Statler brothers, two of us be four brothers. Uh, but that was the time that they actually missed it because of a car breakdown, a vehicle breakdown. But uh, no, I don't think we were ever late. I got in on the tail end of radio. I was really involved in early TV. Tail end of radio, I used to listen to the Lone Ranger. And uh, I remember the fat man, he was a detective. And th those few that I remember, and I still listen, I listen to old time radio now. And I hear things that I never did then, but it was before my time. But I'm a big Jack Benny and Dragnet radio fan. I, I, I love it. I never played sports in high school. I went out for basketball one year, I went one day, and the basketball practice lasted so long and wore me completely out, I never went back. So <laughs> that's a rigid game. I mean, you gotta be in shape, and I didn't want any more of that. I played softball, but that was not in school. Uh, now softball's a girl's sport. But uh, I, I didn't play, I didn't play any sports in school. I have, I had a broken ankle and when I was about 12 years old, playing football, but not in school. Playing at a, at a Boy Scout meeting one night where we were all laid on the field playing. Broke my ankle and I had it to cast for a couple of weeks. My favorite soft drink has been different through the years. We used to. When we would go to town to Nashville to record, Mercury Records always stock all the refrigerators in the office with Dr. Pepper because they knew we were coming and that was our drink of choice. Um, 
I don't, not doing anything. We used to do Dr. Pepper commercials, as a matter of fact. We, uh, you can still hear those, find those on YouTube if they're somewhere. Uh, right now, I'm a Diet Coke guy. Wow. Had a lot of adventures in New York. Loved every one of them. I could, I could do a lot more than one. Uh, I can tell you about, no, I could, the first time we were in New York, we went in to do the Tonight Show with John, with Johnny Cash, when Johnny Carson was still in New York. And um, you had to be a member of the union in order to do the Tonight Show. Uh, and it would cost, I don't can't remember what it cost, anymore, but whatever it was, we didn't have it. In June, Carter paid our union dues for us to join the union. And then we paid her back a couple of months later when we had some bucks in our pocket. That's an adventure I always remember business-wise. Fun-wise, I, I gotta say it was in the 90s when uh, Jerry Lewis was on Broadway. We've always been known that we were a big Jerry Lewis fan growing up. And he invited us to come to, he was doing the Broadway play, Damn Yankees. And he invited us to come and come backstage and visit with him. And so we all went, my family went up, Earl's family went up, and we had a big, I don't know, three or four days there. and. It was fun. I remember that in particular, going to see him and visiting. Videos were a lot of work, a lot of hard work. And I can remember most all of them. Uh, maybe my only love, I'm gonna say that one. I might have written about this in the anthology, the Snatter, music of the Snatter Brothers. We did my only love, and it was like we were all at a wedding I think it was my only love and we all had different wives and I went in that morning to shoot and they had my wife with the girl to play my wife she was 16 years old and I said no no I don't think I want to do this folks I don't want to do it but they say so they run her through makeup and she come out looking like she was 25 uh, but I made sure that there was no intimacy there on camera with just us walking around and talking and whatever we did to it but those are the kind of things you look back on, you kind of cringe, but it, it worked. So many, so many Bible for you. Let me say this one that sticks with me because this goes through my mind every day, so full of wisdom. Uh, Proverbs 3, 5, I think it is. Love the Lord with all your heart, but lean not on your own understanding. And that's always so important, I think, for everybody. We use all 66 of those books. Use them and find out what you truly believe. Find out what the truth is. And don't just say, hey, this fits me. This, this is what I think this means. Know what it means and believe what it means. And that one speaks to me strongly. Lean not on your own understanding. I am an apple guy. Favorite hymn since I was a child. It was uh, number 97 in the blue <laughs> Presbyterian hymn when I was a kid. There, and that's not it, that's Ave Maria. My clock plays a different religious song every hour. And uh, that's a very Catholic hymn. All the rest of them are old hymns. But even my favorite is not on that particular clock. And that would be At the Cross, Isaac Watts. and. Uh, for some reason, I always love that song, still do. And it's such a great song. You'll hear it at Easter a lot, but you need to hear it every day. I have, I have. I've written a few songs since I retired. Uh, nothing I've ever really done anything with, just sort of, you get that burning desire to write it. And I'll go to the piano and sit down and write something. But uh, yeah. Nothing I'm really serious about. Con, you know, every concert, this sounds corny, was so important to us that you went out there and you really wanted to do your best every night. Now, there were some that where we played, you know, you say, well, you played the White House. That was wonderful. We were blessed. Uh, Constitution Hall, I remember doing that with the Air Force Sympathy, Sympathy Orchestra. Um, symphony orchestra, I get my tongue tied here. And um, 
We did it on Easter Sunday one year. Uh, so many, we played with the Dallas Symphony and uh, places like that. But it was the regular concerts every night. It was important because the people were there and they came and it was a special night for them. And we wanted it to be a special night for them. And every night we absolutely gave it everything we had. I can honestly say that. I look back on all of that with, with uh, full, full realization that, that we did the best we could. Yeah, we knew what was going to happen before it even happened. We planned on it so long. We knew a year ahead when it was going to end and where it was going to end and how it was going to end. And uh, the Lord was good enough to let it be just exactly the way we wanted it to be. And that night, walking on stage, I knew it was going to be the last time to walk on stage, and that was not easy to do. We. Um, we stood backstage and had our prayer. Matter of fact, Jimmy Dean was there and brought us on stage. He got in our little circle. We had a prayer with him. And we walked on stage for the last time. And that was harder. That was hard. But the hardest thing was walking off stage for the last time. Because when we finished, when we finished singing Amazing Grace and then stepped back and put our arms around each other, we knew that we were never going to do this again. That was it. We had already decided there'll be no comebacks. There will be no, oh, after a couple of years, let's go out here and do a concert. We knew there wasn't going to be, it was, even no matter how often we were asked. So when we walked off and waved to the crowd, that was the last wave. And we went home satisfied and blessed. Um, I'm going to say, I got to say Irving Berlin. Here's a guy that wrote some beautiful stuff and so very early, I mean, back at the turn of the other century, he was writing songs and I'm gonna say him and I gotta tell you, I'm gonna throw in two country writers with him, Chris Christopherson, who I think just changed country music. I think it was wonderful. And Bill Anderson, who has been a lifetime loyalty to his music. He started this when he was young. He's still doing it today and he's doing it well. And if you can find a better country song than still, then I want to hear it because I haven't heard it yet. Not a great reaction. They were not necessarily against it and uh, they weren't necessarily for it. They were just, okay, if that's what you want to do, give it a try. My mother didn't want me to quit. I was like a, a semester into business college. She didn't want me to quit school, quit college, but, but I did. With the promise I'd go back one day and uh, finish, which I didn't. But uh, that was the only thing, but it was kind of a family joke. Uh, our dad, you know, just just do what you're going to do and be careful. That's kind of the thing that he had. Are you sure you can make a living doing this? That was that was a thought of his, and we would we said yes, but we weren't we weren't sure at all. We had no idea. You go there and take a chance. The Lord just smiled on us. All of those Statler suits in the '70s stick out, no question. But we wore blue with all this braid on it, and red, and all this braid, and white, and we had some flashy suits. But we, at the time, we were just about the only people that were doing that. There were still some nudie suits around from the old days, some of the older artists. But we were doing this, and uh, they stick out. And I gotta say, I enjoyed it. It's nothing, you know, it's not a suit you'd wear downtown. You wear it on stage, and that's it. And when it came time then to, all right, the times are changed a little bit, we are going to go a little more moderate dress, and we started dressing different from each other. I kind of like that. I like to be able to pick out my own suit, my own clothes. So I liked both eras of that. It was it was fun. Stay in touch all the time with Phil and Jimmy. Uh, Jimmy's in Nashville, of course. I don't see him as much, but we talk on the phone a lot. Phil. I see him every Sunday morning at church. Even sometimes we don't see each other during the week, but he's still out and around. Phil doesn't go a lot of places. He likes it like that. 
and it's just uh, it's just so so much of a comfort when I do see them and be able to talk. And we sometimes talk about old times, and sometimes we don't either. Sometimes we talk about what's going on in our lives today. But uh, I'm close to both of them, love them both dearly, miss them dearly, and boy, I had a great life with them.